Ah, good evening, dear friends. I'm very happy that we have an event of uh, um, Evgeny uh, Fix tonight. Uh, Evgeny Fix um, was born in Moscow in 1972 and has been living and working in New York since 1994. I know Zhenia since late 90s. He wrote about art and press as some of us did, which helped us immerse in the world of contemporary art in New York. And he was writing about some of the projects that curated, uh, were created by me and by our friends. Uh, since that, he established himself as a multidisciplinary conceptual artist focused on post-Soviet topics and dialogue with the West creating, as we say, controversial, sharp defined projects uh, with museums, important galleries, art centers, and foundations. Projects such as uh, Pas de Trois uh, in Tallinn, um, uh, Tallinn City Gallery, uh, Mr. Um, Deviant, Com Comrade Degenerate at Zimmerle Art Museum, New Brunswick, Mother Tongue at Pushkin House and Grad Gallery in London. Uh, also, um, Andy Warhol and the Pittsburgh Labor Files, uh, the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, uh, Monument to Cold War Victory, uh, the Cooper Union, New York, Homosexuality and Stalin's Atom Bomb to Destroy America, Winkelmann Gallery, New York. Uh, Communist Tour of MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, Communist Party USA, USA, Marat Gelman, Gallery Moscow, among others. Uh, Evgeny Fix uh, has a special affinity to history. And today, in this tragic day of Ukrainian fight for life and freedom, this project of unrealized utopia, written in Yiddish in Kharkov in 1918, uh, when Kharkov was a part of the short-lived Ukrainian uh, People's Republic uh, from 1917 to 1921, uh, and which was the first modern state uh, to have a Ministry of Jewish Affairs, Yiddish as one of official languages, uh, and to become a cradle of modern Jewish culture. Uh, in these days, this project become even more relevant for all of us. So, Evgeny Fix. Thank you so much, Regina. Let me share my screen and uh, I'll uh, start. Um, uh, so, um, so I'll be talking about uh, a project from uh, 2017 um, called In der Zukunftstadt Yedenia, or In the Future City of Yedenia. Um, so the project um, resulted in a in a show in a large um, group show in in Kharkov in the summer of uh, 2017. But it began, I would say, about five years prior. So it began in um, 2012 when um, when I got a um the original novella in der Zukunftstadt Yedenia from a, a New York based Yiddish scholar uh, Gennady Estreich who teaches at NYU and um, he discovered it uh, at least for uh, for the new generation of uh, uh, Yiddish scholars or Yiddish artists and uh, uh, so I've, I've had that novella since 20, 
Well, um, Gennady Strike sent it to me as a PDF file and, um, and the project began. But I guess I want to talk a little bit before I talk about the novel and the art exhibition, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about my relationship to Yiddish and, uh, and to Ukraine. Um, so I, I, I was born in Moscow in 72, and uh, both of my parents were uh, Russian speakers, uh, uh, native Russian speakers, but all of my grandparents were Yid native Yiddish speakers, and, um, um, and all four of them were born in Ukraine. Uh, so my grandfather, one of my grandfathers, um, uh, Mortko Medvedev, was born in, in Spole. Um, grandmother uh, from my mother's side, Nihama Apteker, was born in Cherkass, in Cherkassi, or in Yiddish Cherkass. Uh, then my um, other grandmother was born in Monasterishe, also Ukraine, and uh, my uh, for, uh, my grandfather from my father's side, um, whose last name I have fixed, um, comes from Berdichev. Um, Avrum Boruch Wolf um, Fix from Berdichev. So, so all of my grandparents were Yiddish speakers who came to Moscow before the war. So, uh, so my grandparents from my uh, mother's side uh, came to just town outside of Moscow right before the war in 39, but my grandparents from my father's side came to Moscow in late 1920s and, uh, and maintained Jewish identity throughout their life and spoke Yiddish at home into the 1970s. Uh, so, uh, so me uh, growing up um, in Moscow, I heard Yiddish at least until uh, 19. Uh, 78 when um, uh, when my grandfather passed away and then uh, so my grandmother didn't have anyone in the apartment to speak Yiddish to but uh, but until uh, 78 I did uh, hear Yiddish at home um, and they spoke Russian as a second language uh, with an accent and so on um, so um, and growing up in Moscow, I and I, I lived with my grandfather, uh, grandmother. I, I heard you know all the stories about Cherkass and the Dnieper River and uh, you know Shulkovitz trees, and uh, so it was really um, something, uh, basically stories of Ukraine, of the Jewish Ukraine, uh, were, uh, I would say, daily, uh, daily occurrences, and something that I heard almost every day. Uh, so um, in, in early 1920, uh, in early um, uh, 2000, I started uh, studying Yiddish in New York and uh, um, kind of reconnected with, with Yiddish. And, um, and I was very curious about discovering this novella in, in Der Zukum Stot Yedenia from Gennady Estreich, because it's a novella about, um, about futurism. It's a futuristic novella. It's futuristic, um, it's, um, it's science fiction, and it's also about this vision of multicultural Ukraine. Um, Multicultural Ukraine, where, where there are multiple languages, where there are multiple cultures, and there is a, a co co there is a coexistence, and there is a, um, a mutual respect, and so on. Um, and uh, I'm not a, a deep uh, kind of scholar of Yiddish uh, literature, but I understood that um, in Yiddish literature there is not that much science fiction, and there is not that much of uh, imaginary utopian fiction. Um, and uh, so it, it felt, I, I need to do something with this novel. And so you're looking at the slide of, um, of this PDF that I got in uh, 2012. 
so in the Tsukum Shtot Yideni, Roman, but it's a novella. It's, uh, it's only about 40 pages long. Um, and uh, you can see that it was published in Harkever Yiddish Farlag in 1918. Um, so the, the author is Ben Yehuda, uh, Ben Yakov, Ben Yakov, uh, and this is um, uh, this is a, um, a pseudonym of uh, writer and publisher Kalman Zingman, who wrote this uh, novella. Now, in 2012, I got in touch with a, a Yiddish uh, translator. Uh, her name was Hani Fagel Turtletaub. And um, over the course of a few months, she, she translated it into, into, Engl uh, into English. And uh, then I, was, I started moving towards, um, in the direction of an art project, to, to make an art project. Now, uh, the project was, um, uh, was a collaborative effort. I worked with a, um, with a collaborator, with um, American-Ukrainian curator and writer, Larissa Babi, uh, who is um, uh, currently still in Ukraine. She is in, in Kharkiv. And she, at this point, she doesn't want to leave Ukraine. Uh, she's still in Kharkiv. I, I'm sorry, she's still in, uh, uh, I think I made a mistake. I said Kharkiv, she's in Lviv. She's, uh, she's currently in Lviv. Um, and in, uh, um, in around 2012, um, I got the novella in around 2016, um, Larissa and I invited contemporary artists to, um, to read this novella in, in the English translation. Only one of our artists could actually read Yiddish. It was a... Uh, um, Russian-Israeli artist uh, Chaim Sokol, who lives in Moscow, so he could read the original Yiddish. Everybody else uh, read the novella in um, uh, English translation. So, um, so here I am um, showing you on the screen a couple of quotations from the novella. And in the exhibition um, in Kharkov in 20. Uh, 17, when we finally had all the artworks from all the artists and we put up an exhibition in Kharkov, uh, we projected these, uh, some of these quotations on gallery walls. And we, we, uh, we projected only Ukrainian and Yiddish. We did not project English, but I, I believe we included in English translations in the uh, in the exhibition uh, booklet. Um, so a couple of quotations here. When I say our community, I'm actually including all the other self-governing peoples. Here we live together so peacefully without any conflicts at all that you can distinguish or separate them from, uh, from the extent of saying, the Jewish community or the Ukrainian one, um, which is the governing one. Um, or another one. Uh, yes, uh, here uh, he thought, agreeing with himself, is this then not the promised land when I drink the wine of Gefinia, learn uh, in my own language at school, build my life as I understand, as I understand it, and do not feel the pressure of a, super, of a supervisor, while in Palestine, all the workers are still fettered. So, so you see um, this hopeful, uh, utopian, hopeful rhetoric. Um, it's hard to say uh, to, to what extent uh, this rhetoric uh, was practiced in 1918, uh, uh, but it's a vision. It's a vision into the future. Um, so the, the story of the novella is 
um, a Jewish guy comes back to the city called Yedenia, uh, which is in Ukraine. Um, and he comes from Palestine. So he, he had immigrated previously, and then he comes uh, to the city in Ukraine, and he sees a transformed city. It's not the city that uh, he remembers from, uh, from before he had left. Um, it's a um, city of coexistence of multiple ethnic communities, multiple languages. Um, it's also a city with some high end technology of flying cars and, and uh, air conditioners. Um, and uh, um, so it's a sci uh, science fiction also. Now, the novella is set. 25 years into the future. So it was written in 20, uh, in, um, in 1918. So 1918 plus 25 years, this is 1943. And this is, and we know what, what was in Ukraine in 1943, right? So we, we, so this vision of this hopeful future of Ukraine, or hopeful future of that city of Yedenia in 1943. So it's definitely, um, well, it's, 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 um, it's, it's very provocative. It's also very sad, right? In a way, it's a, it's a future, it's a, it's a novel about future, um, beautiful utopia, but we, and it's set in 1943. So, so we, we, we have now um, exact knowledge what happened in uh, 1943. Um, now, uh, so you're seeing some of the other hopeful quotations from, uh, from uh, Yedenia uh, of, um, you know, described by Kalman Zingman. Uh, he says that young people only know the term war from history class in school. And they, they, uh, they, there has not been a war in the, in the last 21 years. Um, okay. Uh, so the show was uh, held in the summer of uh, 20. 17 in this wonderful uh, contemporary art space called Yermilov Center. Um, and it's named after uh, Vasily Yermilov, um, super important uh, figure of Ukrainian art, um, contemporary, uh, modern art, avant-garde art, design, uh, art design. Uh, so this space um, uh, has been around for quite some time. It's uh, a part of a university. It's in the basement of, of, the, of the Kharkov University. And it has two um, levels, a ground level and then a basement level. And it's a beautiful space. Now, um, as I mentioned, I curated, um, I co-curated this project with Larissa Babi. Um, and uh, it was an absolute pleasure to work with Larissa um, great intellectual, great, great curator, um, it was amazing uh, kind of curatorial duo um, uh, on this project. And you can see the list of artists and how people identify. I think this is very interesting. Um, it's very wide. So there were artists, there was an artist from Nigeria uh, the war artist there was an Azerbaijani artist who lives in France, who got the political asylum in France by Vibadalov. Efioma, Efioma Anayeji is the Nigerian sculptor. Um, uh, dates, uh, Concrete Dates Collective. Um, it's um, a collective of, of uh, conceptual artists um, um, in, in, uh, from Ukraine, most of them live in Kiev. Then uh, Kurandi Katz, uh, 
artists uh, who split their time between Italy and Canada, uh, uh, Sasha Dedos, Ukrainian artist, and so on and so forth. So you can see quite, um, quite um, uh, representative geographically, in, including post-Soviet space. There were artists from um, Kazakhstan. Um, in, in this uh, show, there was one artist from, from Russia. Um, so it was, it felt that it was very important to make this show international and to invite, to invite many takes on, on this novella, many artistic takes and um, many artistic voices uh, because the, because the, the novel is about futurism of, and internationalism or, or coexistence. Um, uh, but as I mentioned, only one of our artists could, could re read Yiddish, uh, the novella in, in its original form. The rest read, uh, read it in, in the English translation. Um, so this is how the press release looked. And it was very important that uh, that Yiddish is very prominent in this show. We had not only title of the show in Yiddish uh, on the on the um, um, uh, in the exhibition announcements on Facebook, but also um, uh, we had banners uh, with Yiddish very proudly uh, present as one of the legitimate languages of Ukraine. Um, and I'll show some of the larger images uh, with Yiddish a little later. But we also included Yiddish in our captions. Exhibition captions were in Ukrainian and in Yiddish. Um, now, um, so I want to also mention that uh, there was an amazing designer, arch architect, architect designer involved in, in the exhibition, Ivan Milnichuk, who is in, in Kiev also. Um, and uh, um, uh, so the exhibition design in and of itself, I think was a great, a great piece of uh, conceptual art or spatial art, um, was very happy about it. Um, so now I'm showing um, uh, some of the slides of the actual show. Uh, and this is a piece, the piece on the right, a painting that you see is by um, a French uh, Swiss artist, Agnes Ternauer. She lives in Paris, but she identifies as bi binational. And the piece is called Born in, Live in, A State of woman, Womankind. Uh, it's a very large um, uh, work on canvas. And uh, what uh, we see here, we see names of Ukrainian born, um, Ukrainian born or um, Eastern European born, there is one German born, female artists and intellectuals who migrated, who migrated uh, uh, during their life, right? Who um, were, were born in one country and ended up uh, uh, in, in another country and perhaps not moving more than once. And you, you see, for example, Sonia Delaney, um, you see Eva Hess, um, um, Louis Nevelson, Alina Sapozhnikov. So female artists, intellectuals, uh, Ukrainian born, Eastern European born, German born, um, who had to um, flee, move, escape, immigrate during the 20, 20th century. And this, the chairs that you see in the painting, these are, um, it's about the sense of belonging, right? So about uh, your place, right? Where you belong um, and representation, right? that uh, also a chair indicates in this case. So this is another piece by Agnes Ternauer. 
it's an earlier piece. The other, the one that I just showed you, the larger one, it was made specifically for Kharkiv, for our show. But this one is an older piece and it's a triptych. And um, it's also about migrations. It's about uh, the issue of ma mass migration around the world. When millions of people have to uh, get up and leave. Um, and uh, and some of some and some are um, kind of uh, in in a state of in between uh, between leaving um, and going right between between here and there um, uh, and um, uh, so this is a piece from uh, uh, two thousand and eight. Um, so now you see some of the installation shots um, of, of the show. So you see it's an industrial, uh, it's a basement, it's um, uh, of an institution and the people actually um, used um, Kharkiv, uh, the, this Kharkiv uh, art center, your meal of center, the last couple of weeks as a shelter. And um, um, you can find a lot of images on, on Facebook uh, of people um, sleeping on the floor of, the, of this exhibition hall. So uh, it, uh, it's definitely um, used very different uh, the last few weeks. Uh, but I recently, I think the last couple of days I saw uh, somebody posted images that there is an exhibition now. I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, the space is used for an exhibition now, but uh, I'm not sure if the whole space is used for an exhibition or whether part of it is still used as a shelter. Um, um, but uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a shot from 2017, our show. You can see uh, projected quotations from in the uh, novella, in Ukrainian translation, translate, uh, tra projected on the gallery wall. Um, uh, so this is another piece by a, a Greek artist, Ekaterina Gigesian, uh, who lives in London, in, in the UK. And, um, and this piece, um, um, so, so it's, uh, um, it speaks the universal language of uh, a journey across fire, earth, air, and water. And um, the idea of uh, uh, presenting a new grammar, a new language of the material world. And the sources come, um, the sources that Yekaterina used for uh, for uh, for this piece, they come from different geographical locations, from different historical times. Um, uh, so uh, uh, ge geography, history, um, ge uh, overlap, uh, ju juxtapose, um, and uh, uh, I think it definitely rhymes with uh, Kalman Zingman's. Um, His, uh, trans-historical novel, right? Uh, futurist novel. Um, so this is a piece by a Azerbaijani artist, by Biba Dalov, who lives in Paris. And uh, uh, people who uh, uh, have been following Russian art scene probably rem remember uh, Babi from uh, his work in, uh, in St. Petersburg and uh, uh, late Soviet uh, Leningrad, uh, so he was uh, active in uh, kind of avant-garde art circles in late ages, maybe even mid mid ages. Um, and um, since uh, I think fifteen years, uh, he's been in in uh, in Europe, and now he lives in in uh, um, Paris. And this is a piece that he proposed. Uh, now future, no future, 
Um, so, and um, you can see that curatorially, Larissa and I, we decided to place it very prominently in that space where, where, uh, where you, we have the staircase going to the, to the basement level of the show. And it's very prominent. You see this mural, uh, now future, no future, uh, almost as soon as you get into the, into the gallery, into the space of, of your mill of center. Um, uh, so this is a piece by uh, Chaim Sokol, um, a, a Russian-Israeli artist um, who lives in Moscow now, but uh, he um, uh, came from Russia to Israel in, uh, in, uh, in the early 90s and lived for, for Israel for a long time. And then about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he moved to Moscow and he works in Moscow now. Um, uh, now, uh, I, I, I love Haim's work and I've, I've uh, curated his work in many shows. And um, uh, this particular piece called Testimony, it uses multiple, uh, multiple um, narratives or multiple story. Uh, the key story here is that is the testimony, um, the me memoirs of Chaim's father, who was an 11 year old Jewish boy in Ukraine during the Second World War, uh, survived. And, um, and his um, experiences uh, during the Holocaust in Ukraine um, is one of the elements of, of this uh, project. And the project consists of a video and a text. And the other part of the narrative comes from contemporary Russia, contemporary as of 2015, when the piece was made. And it has to do with, um, with my migration records, um, official migration records in Russia, uh, fragments of them. Uh, internet and street advertising, advertising that um, translates a, um, this very clear post-Soviet Russian xenophobia um, targeting migrants from the post-Soviet Central Asian nations. And uh, so in this piece, Chaim, uh, talks about contemporary Russia, and he talks about um, Ukraine of 1940s. Uh, so this, uh, that's how the texts uh, looked in, in the exhibition. So you can see, so you take the stair, you, can, you take the, uh, the staircase down, from that first level of the exhibition where you had by B. Badalov's uh, No Future, Now Future mural and Agnes Ternauer painting, Ekaterina Gigisian's installation piece. And this is, it was the largest installation in the exhibition. You can see the level of the, um, level of uh, kind of uh, basement level of the space. You can see its scale the tall ceilings and you can see also fabric on both sides and uh, that's uh, um, Ivan Milnichuk's architecture that transformed uh, um, this um, basement level into this video video booth for Chaim Sokol. Uh, now uh, this piece is a painting by uh, Yuri Lederman, um, artist who I believe lives in in uh, um, uh, in Berlin now. Uh, he's from Odessa, and um, he uh, also lived for a long time, I believe, in Moscow. I uh, I met him in Moscow in the early nineties, um, and um, and. Uh, uh, Yuri Lederman, I think, is a, uh, one of the major figures of uh, 
of, uh, of conceptualism in, in the Soviet Union, the late Soviet Union, uh, both in, in Odessa, but also in Moscow. Um, and this is a painting. So uh, Yuri Lederman's piece is only the painting that you see in the middle called Self-Portrait in Ukrainian Costume. And, um, uh, and uh, in, in my opinion, it uh, it's, uh, very much has to do with a, a Jewish identity, right? And Jewish identity uh, between Ukraine and Russia. And, and what is the Jewish story? Um, in the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. Um, and uh, I began my presentation today by uh, talking about my, um, uh, the history of my family. Um, so all of whom were Ukrainian Jews who came to Moscow before the war. And, uh, and I think this is a very, um, it's a very common story for Russian Jews for Soviet Jews. Um, uh, so uh, Yuri Lederman is from Odessa. He was born in Odessa um, uh, while I was born in Moscow. Um, uh, but uh, but through my through all of my grandparents, there is this genuine and and uh, uh, tangible connection to Ukraine, to the Jewish Ukraine, to Ukrainian Yiddish. So um, it's, it's interesting that um, I own actually a, a, um, a, a, Vash a Vashivanka that, that I got from my grandfather who, got, who was born in, in Spol in 1889. Somehow I still have it. And he, and the last time he was in Ukraine was in, in, uh, in uh, uh, 1939 but I still have it here in New York. So somehow we, we brought it even uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to the US. I'm not sure what to make of it. Um, so, uh, so this is a piece of uh, uh, Yuri Lederman and you can see, you can see it's um, uh, connects the two spaces, the uh, ground level and the um, basement level. Uh, so now, uh, next piece um, uh, made of uh, textiles. So it's um, 12 embroidered textiles, hand dyed. Uh, the piece is called, this is a piece by Kurandi Katz, and it's called Several Attempts at Suing the Borders of Homelands and Promised Lands. And you see um, blind contour drawings of geographical maps of territories that are um, in conflict or at war or disputed. So um, these are borders of lands that are unrecognized by international law. Uh, so you have Abkhazia here, you have uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you have Quebec, you have South Ossetia, and uh, so on. So uh, it's, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have a close-up of, of these pieces, but the close-up would show uh, lines, contour maps, um, borders of lands on, um, on these uh, embroidered textiles. Uh, there are uh, uh, 12 of them and uh, we were considering um, suspending them and showing them kind of hanging, but then we decided to show them as maps uh, flat um, on, on these uh, pedestals that, uh, again, uh, the architect of the show, Ivan Milnichuk, designed and planned. Uh, so this is another, another piece.
uh, another installation shot. Uh, so this is a piece by um, a Kiev-based artist, Sasha Dedos. Uh, a simple sculptural piece, installation piece that uh, references uh, 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 the Jewish uh, Shabbos. It, it uh, uh, references uh, has references to Christianity, and it uh, it has also references to uh, Soviet uh, era communist customs, uh, such as Subotnik, um, a, a Saturday uh, used for compulsory labor or almost uh, compulsory labor. Um, So a uh, piece is called uh, Friday Before the Last Saturday. Um, uh, this is a very interesting piece, I think, um, by a collective of artists. But the, the piece is called um, Three Paintings in the Exhibition by a collective called Concrete Days, uh, Days Collective. So it consists of uh, several paintings and an audio narration. So you see in front of you, uh, nicely uh, framed in, in gold frames, pictures of this idyllic Jewish life, a private sphere, a public sphere, which are um, idyllic and uh, unproblematic. Uh, there is no conflict there. Um, and uh, uh, what's interesting about these paintings is that one of the artists, one or more artists of this collective, to make a living, paints these pictures. And these pictures are then sent to, uh, to New York, and they are sold in Brooklyn at a uh, Jewish-themed uh, uh, gallery, probably um, uh, uh, probably um, uh, gallery uh, uh, oriented towards a, a religious community, a religious Jewish community. Um, and um, uh, so this is not contemporary art, right? This is art. We can even say it's perhaps kitsch, right? That is uh, um, designed um, for, uh, as a commercial product, as a commercial art product. Uh, but what the artists did, they uh, recorded the narration that people could uh, listen to using these uh, headsets, where they kind of reveal, uh, reveal that story. They reveal um, uh, the story of how these paintings uh, operate in the art market, right? And... Uh, they, they tell the story of they, they being produced in Ukraine by artists, um, and then they ship to um, New York where they're sold. And what's interesting is that it's a different artist name that appears on these paintings. So they, uh, so this, uh, the production of these paintings are outsourced. They're produced by um, some artists in, uh, in Ukraine, and then they're sold in New York and another artist, um, puts, uh, you know, his or her name um, on this painting. So, so it's uh, kind of questions uh, uh, what it means to be a Jewish artist, right? What it, uh, what it, what it means to, to participate in an, art, in an art market, right? And what, and, what, uh, um, and what is, you know, Jewish art these days, right? What is Jewish art in 2017? So you see another, uh, beautifully shot uh, installation uh, photo of the of the exhibition, and uh, all the photos were made by great Kharkiv um, photographer Sergei Salonsky. And um, so you can probably see the the kind of the uh, the, uh, uh, the the amazing quality of of, of the images here. Um, so this is a piece by uh, uh, Tatiana Grigorenko, an artist who lives in Paris. 
um, of um, who grew up in in New York. Uh, um, artist is of Russian Ukrainian descent, and um, uh, so the piece was actually uh, done in relation to Kharkiv and to East Ukraine, and uh, the piece. Um, I was very happy to discover this piece because um, I believe the, uh, the artist already made the work before I um, uh, in, invited Ar uh, Tatiana to take part in the show. And I think it, it, uh, it has you know, a very strong connection to this utopian vision of East, East, East Ukraine, Ukraine in general. And it's, it's futuristic and, there, and it's also really, um, uh, uh, it's a project where fa uh, fact and fiction uh, merge, uh, which is also what our show was all about. So another uh, shot of Tatiana's work. Well, so you see a long shot with the piece um, in the middle, a sculptural piece by Ifeoma Anieji a Nigerian artist, um, and we, um, the artist was living in, in Canada then, and it was, a, it was a big challenge to, to bring it, to bring the piece to, to Kharkiv. Um, so the piece is called Incomplete, um, in reference to, um, to Kalman Zygmunt's narrative in, in, uh, uh, Yedenia in the novella, um, and uh, mm, uh, and the artist actually uses um, uh, the, uh, the artist's native dialect of the uh, Egbo people of Nigeria um, uh, to name this piece. So speaking of multilingual vision, uh, multilingual vision of Ukraine, but also kind of multilingual, multinational, international uh, narrative of our show, of our project in Kharkiv. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably move a little bit faster through uh, some of the images. So maybe there will be some questions also. Now, um, so this is a piece by a, a collective based in Kazakhstan. Although I believe the artist moved uh, by now moved to to Europe to to Central Europe, um, uh, Ruthie uh, Jerenbekova and Marie Vilkavisky, and uh, the piece is um, is a utopian piece. It's also a um, futuristic piece. Um, the artists are envisioning a um, uh, the artists are envisioning. Uh, something from 20, uh, 22nd century, a um, fantastic story um, of how five Central Asian post-Soviet republics trust, transformed into a democrat democratic confederation of autonomous tribes. Um, an absolutely new type of politi political entity, which uh, sur surpasses the level of development of Western uh, democracies. So, uh, in the, in, so uh, they are um, responding to common uh, Zingman's vision for Ukraine and uh, propose a uh, vision for 22nd century Central Asia. Uh, work by um, Kyiv based artist Nikita Kadan who is in Kyiv um, as of yesterday. Yesterday I attended his uh, talk on Zoom. Um, uh, uh, Nikita works a lot with, with history and with the complexities of history, including Ukrainian history. And this particular piece, Repetition of Forgetting, you see um, an installation with pictures, with faces of people. And uh, these faces are artists of the Boychuk school um, of um, uh, the, the so-called 
uh, executed renaissance um, of Ukrainian artistic life um, of 19, 1920s, 1930s. Um, uh, so, uh, so this piece uh, was one of Nikita's piece in the exhibition and it was accompanied by another piece called Viewers. You can see uh, these works on on uh, the wall, and you can see a close up a close up shot of the installation from the previous side, and it's based on uh, Alexander Rochenko's uh, 1934 um, album, Ten Years of Uzbekistan." So already this kind of wild internationalist story uh, between. A, between the work of con contemporary Ukrainian artists, um, uh, Alexander Rochenko, and uh, with the connection to Uzbekistan of 1930s, uh, kind of through the Soviet, uh, Soviet ex ex experiment, Soviet experience. And uh, so all these uh, leaders of Uzbekistan were, were repressed in 1937, 1930s. Uh, Eight, so their faces were uh, blacked out by, by Rochenko and uh, um, as enemies of the people. Uh, and, uh, and then Nikita intervenes, uh, contemporary Ukrainian artist Nikita Kadan intervenes and adds these spirits of history, spirits viewers. If you look closely at uh, these uh, uh, blackened uh, faces, uh, you can see uh, those, those uh, features of spirits viewers, spirits of history. Um, work by um, uh, another um, um, uh, contemporary Ukrainian artist, uh, Mikola Ridney, who is um, as of now in Lviv, uh, he's from Kharkiv. Uh, Mikola, uh, 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 Mikola Ridney is the person who actually got us in touch with Yermilov Center and arranged for, uh, made the introduction and arranged for, uh, for the exhibition, for the Yedeni exhibition take place at Yermilov Center. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is a video piece called Gray Horses, and it's based on the narrative of, of uh, uh, on memoirs of uh, um, of the artists um, um, of the artist uh, great grandfather, um, who was an anarchist during the nineteen twenties, and. Uh, uh, this is a piece where uh, fiction and fact uh, intermingle, uh, and uh, um, and uh, uh, in this video piece, contemporary um, contemporary Ukrainian anarchists, police officers, students, and workers are playing characters from from nineteen twenties. Uh, so it was another video booth installation. Uh, the, uh, the last piece that I wanted to show you, unfortunately, I cannot uh, exhibit it. I cannot show anything on the screen. It was a sound piece. It was a sound art piece uh, by Kapani uh, uh, Kiwanga, um, artist who lives in Paris, for, uh, who's from Canada. And uh, the piece kind of activates this uh, um, colonial or post-colonial um, story of a sound transmitted between the Netherlands and uh, Indonesia, who uh, was at that time, uh, in 1927, a Dutch colony. And uh, this message, that sound recording message, um, uh, uh, is repeatedly transmitted uh, between the Netherlands and Indonesia 
until the sing signal becomes an obstruction. Um, so the last couple of slides, I want to show you uh, the opening. You can see um, uh, Larissa Babi uh, is leading a tour of the show. So I'm talking about one of the pieces in the show, uh, some of the artists, um, also the editor, a gentleman in, in, in uh, this checker short in the, in the middle is, uh, um, uh, is the editor of uh, um, Hebraic Ukrainic uh, magazine, scholarly magazine in, in Ukraine. Um, his name is um, Vitaly. I, uh, the, the last name I'm, I escapes me. Maybe I'll, I'll, it will come back to me in a few slides. Um, so this is the opening. And it was an amazing uh, historical occurrence during that opening. Well, um, we knew that it's going to happen because we invited to the opening the grandson of Kalman Zingman, the writer of Yedenia, the, the author of In the Tsukumstot Yedenia, in the future city of Yedenia. Um, so, um, so you see on um, the left, uh, Kalman Zingman's grandson, who is actually very well known um, Russian Soviet theater director, Kama Ginkas. Um, so who came to Kharkiv for our opening from Moscow, he took a train and it was already, um, it was already during the war in the East between Ukraine and Russia. Um, and, um, and Kama Ginkas um, had to get a special uh, letter from the Yermilov Center to, to be allowed in uh, properly. So he, um, it was amazing to, to, to see him there. And uh, he spoke at the opening. Um, so Kama Ginkas was born in, um, um, he was born in, in Kaunas, uh, in 1941, uh, in May 1941, I believe. Uh, so he was born before, uh, before the war, he, um, well, during the war in, uh, in, uh, in Lithuania, and he survived. Um, and not, um, not many members of his family survived uh, the Holocaust in, in Lithuania. And, um, uh, and at the opening, uh, uh, Kamaginka said, well, each time you in the audience, you know, you curators, or you, uh, your Milov Center director say, Kalman Zingman, I, um, Shrek for a second because uh, because Kalman is my name. So uh, Kama Ginkas's given name is Kalman. He was uh, named after his grandfather, the writer um, Kalman Zingman. So it was um, I don't know. It was probably years since um, Kama Ginkas uh, has heard. Uh, uh, the name of his grandfather, but also his name, and uh, that also in the context of a, of a, an exhibition uh, focused on uh, on his grandfather's uh, writing, uh, because uh, Kalman Zingman uh, passed away in 1927. He passed away in 1927, I believe, in Crimea. Um, so he did not see, uh, he did not uh, leave to, um, to see what had happened to, uh, to Ukraine, to the, uh, to the Jewish world in Ukraine in, during the Second World War, or uh, to, um, to 
Lithuania or Jewish Lithuania, where his family lived uh, when the uh, when the Second World War broke. And um, so you see um, outside of the exhibition hall, so uh, Kamaginkis in the middle and uh, um, um, uh, that, uh, Tatiana uh, uh, next to to him, and I'm on the other side. Uh, Tatiana Grigorenka, and you can see uh, Yiddish in their Tsukumstot Yedenia very proudly, very large in, in the background. Uh, so this is me and Larissa Babi in front of the same uh, show. And I think the last slide I want to show you just very kind of um, like um, us goofing around on the day of the opening. So you can see Larissa Babi, uh, of course, on um, on the on the right, and in the middle, our friends um, uh, from Paris, who, uh, Paris and New York, Vlad Davidson and uh, Regina Marinovska, who came for the opening. And I'll end again with this slide of uh, uh, the first page of. In der Zukunftstadt Hidenia by Kalman Zingman. Um, uh, so I um, uh, I would like to stop here, and I would like uh, would like to welcome any questions or comments. Uh, Zhenia, thank you so much. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, it was a real, a real surprise because Kama Ginkas is my very dear friend who I know from my youth, actually. Um, he was uh, studying at the Theatrical Institute and I was at the Academy of Art and we are friends for, but I've, I know his story. I know how he was born in Kaunas. He was in ghetto, how the family get out of ghetto. I know the whole story, but I never ever had any idea that his grandfather is a writer and especially a writer of this utopia. It's just amazing, amazing, totally amazing. So thank you so much. And maybe um, some of our friends uh, want to, uh, um, to chat, to ask some questions. Uh, I think you will be interested to respond. I see uh, Donata from Italy. Donata, uh -huh. hi. Hi, hi, hi Donata. Ciao. Ciao, Gina. Everybody. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, Sik. <laughs> Ciao, Gina. Donata also yeah. is very much interested in Russian avant garde and futurism and supremacism, especially. Yeah, Absolutely. so uh, also maybe some other, our, you know, uh, friends and uh, viewers uh, would like to ask any question. How, my, how much time it took to uh, put together this project with so many international artists? Sure, thank you. Um, I think, um, well, so I think almost, so it took five years since I got the novella from Gennady Estreich. So I, yeah, I got it in 2012, and then the show was in 2017. So five years, but but um, we did not start working on the exhibition right away. So I think the exhibition probably a year and a half, maybe two years, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. So Larissa joined me a little bit later. I think I already had the, I already commissioned the translation from um, uh, Hani Feigl. Uh, turtle taub um maybe or maybe uh, she was still working on the translation but yeah i think a production the active production probably about year and a half two years um 
and also again you're right about i mean it's it's i'm i'm, I'm also i'm not surprised that you know uh, come again because but but uh, but i think it's interesting that uh since since the show i've gotten at least i think two emails from other relatives of mm -hmm. um of of Kalman Zingman uh, there, uh, so i think there is a cousin there is a cousin of Kama who lives in Israel mm -hmm. and and i she asked me for photographs His of the show also lives in israel yeah right 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 and um and i think there was another another cousin so uh, right, and uh, and from what I understood from Kama is that they knew that the grandfather was a writer, a Yiddish writer, mm -hmm. but none of uh, none none of them could read Yiddish, right? And and also, I mean, the grand grandchildren, and then and then so they knew that there was this uh, writer from 1920s. Uh, he wrote in Yiddish. He's you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's our grandfather, but none of them really. I don't think they've ever read anything that he has written. So maybe they felt he was a minor writer. Uh, I'm not sure, but they, but but he definitely means a lot for, for Yiddish literature. I mean, especially for for the kind of utopian. How did you find him? How did you find Kama? Kama? How did you know that he is a relative? I'm trying to, I'm trying to recall i mean it's possible that i was trying to find some relatives maybe and i think the cousin in israel uh, got in touch with me first and maybe she told me that come again because his dad the uh, mm -hmm. cousin maybe yeah and i think uh, i think the cousin in israel i think was planning well, was considering coming to uh, Kharkiv, mm -hmm. but but never did. But but uh, but uh, but Ginkas was closer, so yeah, yeah. It was a nice final touch <laughs> of the story. Thank can you. Very I much. Ask, can I Lisa, ask? Can I Maybe you want to ask something. Yes, yes. I, uh, more current events is on my mind, of course, with what's happening now in Ukraine with Russia. Yeah. So are there art museums and art that will be destroyed with this bombings or, or nobody will know until this is finished? Yeah. We don't know what left in Kharkov, for example, because it was bombed extensively. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, and recently, uh, the theater in uh, Mariupol uh, was destroyed totally. And the artists and some people were in the basement. And um, hopefully and thankfully to God, they survived. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them survived. But mm -hmm. it's unbelievable to bank a, bomb a theater. And even in front of the theater, they put in Russian language, like, deity, children. And it was still bombed. So I saw that on the news, yes. I, they yeah, showed it's it unbelievable, unbelievable. A uh, few museums are destroyed. And we don't know when it will be finished, because the only thing they can now to just bomb uh, people. And unfortunately, cultural institutions as well. So it's it's a tragedy. What it's a pity. Tragedy. What a pity. Yeah, it's real tragedy. So utopia, unrealized, totally. And is there a large Jewish population now, or has there been in Ukraine? It was pretty big uh, population. And you know that uh, like about 100,000 uh, people, mostly Jews, but not only Jews, left for Israel and uh, for different places, probably. Maybe Zhenia knows more mm -hmm. about Jewish population. Um, the Jews that are... 
When you were in the Kharkov, uh, did you meet with Jewish community? Was interesting. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of people, young, younger people from a, from Jewish community who came to the opening, but not a lot. I think mm -hmm. maybe there were two or three people. Um, it's hard for me. To, I couldn't uh, tell how how big is Jewish community in uh, um, in uh, uh, in Kharkov. Um, yeah, not because sure. I you know, I read and I hear that there has been a large Jewish community in all of Ukraine, but I'm surprised because I thought they were either killed or escaped, you know, after the Holocaust. Right. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, Ukraine had huge, huge Jewish community. Um, so, for example, uh, I mean, uh, my, my grandfather was from a uh, small town called um, Spola, and Spola was 45% uh, Jewish and 55% and non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very, it probably was true for many, many uh, towns in Ukraine. Um, um, and the Yiddish language was spoken uh, in Ukraine, not only by Jews, by, but also by by Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. It was it was the language of the marketplace, and um, so. But of course, uh, it was the community was di uh, di disseminated uh, during the, the Holocaust, uh, and then uh, and then then people started leaving uh, starting in the seventies. Uh, leaving uh, to come to. America or uh, US, US, Israel, and so on. Yeah, all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Ukraine, it was killed about 2 million Jews. And um, recently, I was in Belarus, for example. And in Belarus, it was, uh, as in Lithuania, it was like uh, at least 55% of Jewish population. So at least if half. In Vilnius, for example, um, it was like 75% of Jews. All were killed. Uh, it's unbelievable. But um, some Jewish families came back from uh, who were able to escape at the beginning of the war. They came back to Ukraine or in Belarus, but of course the Jewish population is not comparable to what it was before the war. And uh, you know, it's very painful when you are visiting um, especially uh, shtetls, former shtetls, where is no one Jewish person is today. Mm -hmm. You just can feel it. You can feel it that how Jewish population was wiped out of these countries. 